18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Hello and welcome to GB News Sunday. Hope you're having a wonderful weekend out there. Thank you for joining us this lunchtime. I'm Dawn Neeson and for the next two hours, lucky you, I'll be keeping you company on TV, online and on digital radio. Now, cracking show coming up in the first hour. We have Jeremy Hunt admitting on GB News he wants to scrap national insurance. But could this rescue his party? Could anything? And an official review is set to recommend a ban on protests outside schools. Highlighting the case, you will remember this, of a teacher who was forced into hiding after showing pupils a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad. So should a buffer zone be established outside of all our schools? And amid the controversy over changes to the St George... Yes, that story, that flag on the England shirt, I'll be asking, why does no other flag get treated like ours? And should we be more proud to be English? Which things? I have someone Scottish on the panel. Maybe be interesting. Uh, this show is nothing without you and your views, though. So, uh, let me know what you're thinking about any of the stories we're talking about today. Easy to get in touch. Email at gbviews at gbnews.com or message me on our socials. We're at GB News. But first, it's the news headlines with Erin Armstrong. A very good morning to you. It's a minute past one. Good afternoon, I should say. Uh, let's get you up to date with the headlines. Islamic State has released new footage which appears to back up the terror group's claim it was behind Friday's attack in Moscow. Russians are observing a national day of mourning after at least 133 people were killed. It's the worst attack on Russian soil for two decades. With a new video released by IS show gunmen filming themselves moving through the venue, searching for victims. We've chosen not to show it. President Putin has suggested without evidence Ukraine was involved, which Kyiv says is absurd. The White House has described the attack as heinous and Islamic State as a common terrorist enemy that must be defeated. Well, the sound there of Ukraine being hit by a series of Russian attacks overnight. Residents in the capital, Kyiv, were forced to shelter in subway stations. Missiles also struck critical infrastructure in the western region near Lviv, breaching Polish airspace. Poland is a NATO member.
At least 10,000 civilians have been killed in Ukraine since Russia's invasion. The Prince and Princess of Wales have said they're enormously touched by the kind messages of support. Catherine announced her cancer diagnosis on Friday and revealed she's started preventative chemotherapy. A statement from Kensington Palace also said the couple are grateful the public understand their request for privacy. The Chancellor's defended the government's record on affordable housing after claiming £100,000 a year is not a huge salary. Jeremy Hunt says it doesn't go as far as you'd think for people in his Surrey constituency amid higher house prices and the rising cost of living. The average home now costs around eight times the average income. In the 1990s, it was half that. The Chancellor told Camilla Tomini lower taxes will make a difference. The average house price is in that part of the world £670,000. Mm. If you've got a mortgage, if you're paying childcare, um, what looks like a very high salary doesn't go as far as you might think it would. If you look at the average salary in this country, £35,000, um, they have been feeling the pinch and those people will see their tax bills go down by £900 this mm. year. If you look at people on an even lower salary, uh, the lowest legally payable salary, the national living wage, because I've increased that to £11.44, they will see if they're working full-time, their income go up by £1,800. However, the Labour Party chair, Annalise Dodds, says tax rises are to blame and she's promised a Labour government will bring change. Now, there's a big difference, Camilla, between what Labour is setting out, especially on taxation, and what we're seeing under the Conservatives. We've seen taxes going up 25 times under the Conservatives. Our instinct is always to make sure that working people are not paying the price for government mistakes. That's what's happened, I'm afraid, under the Conservatives. So, of course, our approach would always be to try and reduce that impact on working people. We've seen the opposite, I'm afraid, under recent Conservative governments. Chilling levels of harassment are posing a serious threat to schools. That's according to an independent government adviser. A review led by Dame Sarah Khan will be published tomorrow, showing more than 75% of the public feel they can't speak their mind. It suggests many people feel society's become more divisive and cites the case of a teacher who went into hiding after showing a caricature of the Prophet Muhammad during a class. Dame Sarah says journalists, teachers and people working in the arts are subjected to severe levels of abuse, often resulting in self-censorship. It's understood the report will recommend a series of measures, including a ban on protests, within 150 metres of schools. And China is believed to be targeting Britain with a wave of cyber attacks aimed at disrupting the democratic system. The Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden is expected to warn MPs tomorrow about state-backed interference in Britain's political system by Chinese hackers. It's understood some Chinese officials have been summoned by Parliament's Director of Security in relation to the cyber threats. It comes after a report last year found Britain's underprepared for a large-scale ransomware attack due to a lack of investment. Well, for the latest on our stories, sign up to GB News Alerts. Uh, the cue cards on your, the cue codes on your screen right now. Uh, more details on our website, gbnews.com. Now it is back to dawn. Thank you very much, Erin. Right, let's get straight into today's story, shall we? Chancellor Jeremy Hunt has stood by his claim that one hundred thousand pounds is. Not a huge salary. Uh, Camilla Tomini pressed him on this earlier today on GB News. Let's have a listen to what he said, shall we? A hundred grand isn't a large amount of money to earn. Well, um, I was talking to a lady who was explaining to me the average house prices in that part of the world six hundred and seventy thousand mm. pounds. If you've got a mortgage, if you're paying childcare, um, what looks like a very high salary doesn't go as far as you might think it would and <clears throat> but you know but when... that's under 40 <clears throat> years of Tory rule isn't it I mean a hundred grand is what four times more or less the average salary in this country so that's a hell of a lot of money to earn isn't it why, why are people on a hundred grand feeling that they don't have enough money under a Conservative government the reason is because um, we've been through a very difficult period we've had a pandemic we've had an energy crisis and by the way it's not just people on that salary it's people mm. on all salaries 
Mm, interesting, huh? The Chancellor was also asked about his future tax and spend plans and he confirmed that he wants to abolish national insurance completely. But yes, I would like to bring the absolute levels of tax down. I Absolutely. Mean, and I've started on that. Would you like path. to scrap NI completely? Yes, I would like I mean, when, employees... you, when can you imagine being able to do that? If if you offered that, for instance, in a fiscal event before the election, which was obviously be good electioneering, when would that feasibly be able to take place? Well, I can't responsibly promise a date because it depends on all sorts of things, including, you know, what Putin does in Ukraine and mm. international energy prices. But what I can say is that uh, for two fiscal events in a row, for the autumn statement and the budget, I have been able to make a significant cut in personal taxation without increasing borrowing, without risking our public services. And a Conservative government will go further because we've shown we can do it and we'll continue on that journey. Mm. Hmm, interesting. Joining me now is political commentator Peter Spence to analyse what Mr Hunt has said this morning. Hello, Peter. Thank you for joining us on this lovely Sunday afternoon. Now, My let's, let's, let's start with the £100,000. Not being a lot of money, really, is it? What do you make of that, the fact that it's doubled down on it? Well, I mean, I, 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 to quote you, hmm, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, I've copyrighted that now, by the way. I'll be using it a lot, yeah, I suspect, okay, coming fine, up. From now on. Fine. I mean, the fact is that it is 100 grand. OK, he represents a posh part of the country, and I dare say house prices are pretty stonkingly high in his neck of the woods, but the fact is that 100 grand is still f above four times what you'd be expecting on the minimum wage, and therefore to expect it to play very well with the punters is a very debatable uh, concept. I mean, Jeremy Hunt has a knack of looking like a rabbit caught in the headlights mm. at the best of times. He just looked, when he was answering that question, he just looked that little bit more frozen. Didn't he just? I mean, it was a great. I mean, Camilla was great with him today. I thought she she yeah. you know did a really good interview about than most people do with Jeremy Hunt. Most people fall asleep, to be honest with you. Um, but is it <laughs> is it just? I mean, how is this going to play with the with the red wall voters? I mean, you know, you know, in the north, they're the ones that got the Tories into power in 2019 on the Brexit promise, and and they're going to be going on. And what's the average salary in this country? I mean, just over thirty thousand pounds a year. They're going to be going. Hold on a minute. You're struggling on £100,000? What about living in the real world? Are our politicians completely out of touch with what ordinary people are thinking and feeling? Well, I mean, that's certainly what they would say, and it is worth bearing in mind there was a, a YouGov poll earlier in the week which suggested that Reform UK is actually up north in that neck of the woods, is actually in front of the Tories. Now, of course, it happens that their their power base is, is too evenly spread, so or they, while they probably wouldn't get very many MPs when the Tories get uh, obliterated, maybe, what they will be doing is opening the door wide for the Labour Party. Yeah, and the Labour Party, I mean, the, the other thing we, we've come to is the, the pensions triple lock, which, which the Tories seem to put yeah, so much stay on. I mean, is that going to win over voters, Peter? Are people going to be... I mean, we know that older people tend to vote Conservative. The youngsters, they're not interested whatsoever in the Tories. So is that going to be a vote winner, though? I mean, the, the triple lock is staying. He's confirmed that's going to be the Conservative manifesto. Is that going to win the older voters over? Well, I heard, heard one Tory MP saying in the week that all we can do now is to march towards the end of the... towards the sound of the gunfire. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's a question at this stage of winning over votes. It's simply a matter of hanging on to them and persuading them with something little short of a pointed stick to go out and jolly well vote. And, of course, they do have the older vote and they're determined to hang on to it because... because uh, that what they do not want is to be utterly obliterated at the general election and already the bloodbath is effectively underway, the, the, the fight for the soul of the Conservative Party with that reform tendency, fabulous ammunition for those on the right wing of the party to, um, to, to take the party somewhere completely different. The only question that really remains is whether they're going to get the daggers out before 
or after the election. This is the thing, isn't it, Peter? It's another Sunday, another day of bad news for Rishi Sunak. We only need a yeah. couple more letters and the PM will be gone, said one story today. These are the words of former Cabinet Minister Simon Clark in recent days as he urged disenchanted Tory MPs to submit letters of no confidence in the Prime Minister. Do we need another Prime Minister? Will it make any difference? Um, <laughs> how can I put this now? I mean, it wouldn't so much be voted out of office as laughed out of office, I think, <laughs> if they had yet another Prime Minister, yet another mm. leader who, by the way, would be unelected. I mean, there's all sorts of talk of various people, the Penny Mordens, whatever, of taking over. But that's sort of a parallel universe. Wouldn't it be nice? You know, I mean, what I say is I, I'm with the, with the Chancellor. I say, wouldn't it be nice if we got free beer for all the workers? But, you know, dream on, guys. It's not happening. Yeah, free beer and that £100,000, which isn't a lot of money, so I'll, I'll, I'll accept that. Thanks very much, Mr Hunt. Uh, Peter Spence, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Right, OK, let's see what my panel make of this one. I'm joined by GB News presenter Albie Emicona and broadcaster and journalist Claire Muldoon, who is Scottish, by the way, which will be interesting <laughs> coming up to the football thing later. In any case, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Um, coming to you first, Claire, what do you make of what you heard from Mr Hunt this morning? <clears throat> I've got two questions for the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Just two. <laughs> Just two. One, does he wish he had a different surname and could he change it? <laughs> and secondly, secondly, far more importantly, I think his statement is completely and utterly tone deaf. There are, what, the top 5% of earners in I this country? I think there's actually 3% <clears throat> of people who, are who earn over £100,000. £100, you know, and we've got, you know, people are desperately trying to survive in this country. We have got jobs that need to be filled. We've got a benefit system that's broken. We've got people who are politically homeless and we might have someone homeless in number 10. He might be getting evicted. Um, so it, the place is in a mess. And I think for someone of his stature in the government to make a statement like that, I actually think it's quite abhorrent. And then, then Albie, he doubled down on it. He said that earlier in the week and said it again this morning. Well, he was, he was right to double down on it because, actually, if you listen to what he said, other than just saying that £100,000 isn't a lot of money where he comes from, he actually goes on to explain why he made that point. And he made the point because housing in his constituency, I think the average house price is something like £670,000 if you're paying a mortgage on that, if you're also paying for childcare, if you're then also paying for your family's life, perhaps you have a stay-at-home mum and there's only one person working, that where he is from, in Surrey, in his constituency, £100,000 doesn't go far. And I think a lot of his constituents would echo that sentiment. It was, in fact, one of his constituents that told him that. One of the and someone, And, Claire, let me finish. And if he wants to win his seat, which is going to be a marginal seat between him and the Liberal Democrats at the next election, yeah. he needs to be representing his constituents' interests, and that's what he was doing this morning. But as Camilla pointed out, though, Claire, I mean, it's like it's the Tories that have been in power. We haven't built enough houses, that's why housing prices yeah. are so high. Um, you know, childcare costs are through the roof. You really genuinely probably can't afford them in £100,000 a year. Yep. Um, but who's, what is that? Well, it, you know, it's, it's the market forces that supply and demand because one councillor in Spelthorne, which is a constituency, a council constituency within Surrey, the average age, the average salary is £44,000. Right? So it's not across the board. And if average house prices in Surrey are 600,000, then that's a lot less than they are in London. And that's why we've got a rental problem in London as well. Mm -hmm. So the, the, who's blame? No one is to blame. We've got zero hour contracts, which I think build a huge burden onto salaries, onto the ability to work. And as I said, the broken benefit system, completely and utterly wrong. We're supposed to be enabling people to work. We need to get people into work. It's a great thing for working parents to show due diligence, to show um, um, discipline to their children and reward, re financial reward as well for going out to work. People's mental health will become better. Mm -hmm. You know, the nation will be, get, will be getting better. Mm -hmm. Get back to work, help people get into work. And if mother Fathers want to stay at home, or fathers want to stay at home, then that should be a legitimate um, um, role in society as well, and ought to be um, paid for through tax breaks. Well, well, exactly. Very, very good points there. Talking of the other end of the age spectrum, Albie, mm. which I know you're not, by the way. Um, the triple lock on pensions—that's going to be Tory manifesto. That is going to stay now. 
What do you make of that? Is that a good thing? Will that win the voters mm. over? Yes, look, he's committed to the triple lock on pensions. I don't think anyone is particularly surprised at that. I think now both the Labour Party and the Conservative Party have committed to the triple lock on pensions and they're hoping to win what they call the grey or the silver vote. So I'm sure for, for, for the pensioner portion of society Actually, uh, uh, that just, goes uh, sorry, out and votes... Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Annalise Dodds this morning was a bit shaky on whether they were committed to it or not. I'd be very surprised if Labour did not commit to the triple lock on pensions because ultimately what not neither party wants to do in election year is be the one that says we're not going to commit to it because then it causes a huge political problem with them. For whatever reason, we seem to be wedded to the triple lock on pensions in this country and the party that says they're not going to stick to it probably won't win the you next election. You sound like you don't think it's a good idea. No, I don't think it's a good idea. I've said that many times before. I think we need to be looking at a more tailored system of state pension administration rather than just saying, well, we're going to give everyone, regardless of whether or not you need it or not, a state pension at the highest measure, whether that's earnings, whether that's inflation, whether or not that's CPI, plus 2.5, I believe yeah, it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. And obviously, by the time you get to retirement age, it'll be about 100, so you'll never get one in any Well, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right, uh, well, uh, that, that's Jeremy Hunt done and dusted for now. I suspect we will be coming back and, and that, you, in my head now about his surname. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to concentrate really hard now. Uh, right, in any case, for all the best analysis and opinion on that story and <laughs> much more, go to our website, gbnews.com. Now, it's time for the Great British Giveaway. Da, 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 da. We need a drum roll or something, don't we? We've got a shopping spree, a garden gadget bundle and £12,345 in cash. And here's how it could all be yours. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax free cash. Text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Good luck indeed. Get cracking. Go on, I wouldn't mind that. Barbecue, spring coming, Easter coming up. In any case, uh, you're with me, Dawn Eastmore on GB News Sunday. Happy weekend. Uh, lots more coming up on today's show. The government is set to be advised to establish buffer zones around schools as part of an official review which highlights the case of a teacher, I remember this one, who was forced into hiding after showing pupils at Batley Grammar School a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad. All of that and much more to come. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Britain's Newsroom. Weekday mornings from 9.30. Men's mental health, yeah. men are starting to talk a lot more. Yeah. You've been through a lot of stuff that uh, people don't know about. Yeah, I mean, um, the last few years for me have been very, very difficult. Um, people, don't, people see me on tour, performing, making music. Um, but um, myself and my wife, um, you know, we went through um, two miscarriages, oh, um, wow. you know, and, you know, for us, that was a very devastating mm, of time and very difficult to, to, to know how to kind of process those emotions. Mm. And I guess as a man, I, I did the thing of bottling up my emotions and where I feel comfortable to, to be able to express myself is in the studio. Whereas, you know, she had obviously a different reaction to, you know, what happened to us because not only was it happening to her mentally, psychologically, but it was happening to her physically as well. And I think what something that she really would wanted to see from me was that sensitivity and that emotion. And I thought that as a man being strong was trying to bottle up my emotions and just show her that, no, mm. you know, that I'm, I'm being strong for her. Mm. But actually being strong was, is talking about it. Mm. And what's happened ever since I've started to talk about it is I've spoken to more men that have experienced baby loss. My wife forced out of me, you know, how do you feel? And I end up 
as a mess on the floor. I was exasperating, crying, oh, yeah. almost inconsolable. She was just holding me in her arms um, as we cried together, and we cried together. Um, and I didn't realise I needed that release so badly. Like I said, I've been able to speak to other men, and 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 we've been able to cry together. And they've they shared their own experiences, which they did similar to me. But actually. You know, as men, I feel like that conversation and that sensitivity and being able to be mm. emotional together. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to GB News Sunday with me, Dawn Neeson, on your telly, online and on digital radio. Now, the royals. The Prince and Princess of Wales have thanked the public for the outpouring of support they've received since Kate revealed her cancer diagnosis. Kensington Palace said William and Kate are enormously touched by the kind messages they've received and that they are grateful for the understanding of their request for privacy. It comes after the princess revealed in a video message that she's undergoing a preventative chemotherapy after test done following her surgery in January. It showed cancer had been present. Uh, now, joining me is royal commentator, the very lovely Jenny Bond, who has worked with the royals. I know them pretty much better than most people. Jenny, thank you so much for um, joining us this afternoon. Jenny, I'm going to... The worst words you can pretty much hear are, oh, I'm sorry, it's cancer. It's, it's, it's a shock, no matter what time or age you hear it. It's an awful thing to hear. So we had this very emotive video message from Kay and the fact that the country have got behind her. Are you surprised by the, as we say, the outpouring of warmth for Kay in that video message? No, I'm not, because it was extraordinary that mm. she took that step wrote every word herself and uh, we hear that she wanted to she wanted personally to break the news to the nation because she knew we'd all be you know horrified by it as i'm sure she said the, the huge shock they felt um no i'm not surprised because she is the most popular member of the royal family and has been for quite some time she really is the, the jewel in the crown um so i th i think also quite a lot of people are feeling guilty that mm. uh, they entertained the rumours that were on social media by uh, disgusting trolls. And um, so I think there's quite a lot of eating humble pie as well today. Now, Jenny, I mean, you mentioned the people that were falling down. Look, we, we are human, OK? I must admit, I, you know, even I was going, oh, my God, really? How can you think that? And going down the rabbit hole of conspiracy theories. But there are a lot of people that, you know, people like George Galloway, for example, an elected politician, coming out with some, frankly, bonkers theories. Um, do you think these people now should be apologising? Yes, I do, because I think that those rumours, some of them did get to Catherine, and mm. how how painful it must have been when she was also already under incredible stress um, to hear, I mean, really vicious and malicious rumours online. Uh, but anyway, that's over now, and I hope we've all learned a lesson that we don't go down those rabbit holes, and certainly the mainstream media and serious journalists like you and like me should not entertain giving those rumours the oxygen of publicity. I think that lesson probably has been learned. And as a result, we have this outpouring of uh, affection 
and they are now up at Amber Hall in Norfolk on the Sandringham Estate. Um, they will be trying to give as much normality as possible to their children. They love it there. It's a, it's a haven for them. Um, they get a lot of privacy there. Um, and there's also the farm at Sandringham. The kids love playing on the farm there, on the tractors, and uh, George likes to get the animal feed on the tractor and, and take it around the animals. Um, so this is where they will be trying to put this behind them mm. and get on with life. Yeah. Jenny, you've worked with the royal family for a very long time now. You know, I think it's fair to say, King Charles fairly well. Um, the fact that he's also going through cancer treatment at the same time as he calls her beloved daughter-in-law. How, how do you think they'll be coping with this, the two of them together? Will they be supporting each other? Oh, absolutely, I think. I mean, I understand that they had lunch together, a private lunch last week, just the two of them at uh, Windsor Castle. The King went there. Um, especially to, to enjoy a little bit of special time with Catherine. And he's a very sentimental man and a very emotional mm. man. And I gather it was an emotional meeting, but uh, they must take great comfort. I'm sure they were comparing notes of how their treatment is going and how it's making them feel. But I think that he is he's very, very sad that um, his beloved, and he, they really are close, his beloved daughter-in-law has had this happen to her in the prime of life when she was so active, so sporty, looked the picture of health. And then this out of the blue um, has, has failed her, but hopefully not for long. Got to be optimistic. We've got to take what she said, which has been telling her children, I'm OK and yeah. I'm getting stronger. Absolutely. And she was also very, um, very pointedly mentioned William and said what support he was. Now, do you think in William's mind, he lost his mum when he was very young. Kate is very young, but both women are fit, they're healthy, they're sporty. They both have young families, obviously completely different circumstances with Diana's tragedy, the car crash and, and Kate's health worries. But do you think at the back of William's mind, there must be that, is history going to repeat itself? I'm, you know, that must be an anxiety for him. It must be underlying anxiety for him. I mean, he must be, if, if I was him, I'd be thinking, that why me, why me? This happened when I was mm. 15. Um, now I'm, I don't have my brother anymore. I don't have my mother. I don't have my brother. My father has cancer. And now my wife, my mm. darling wife, who is my rock and means everything to me, uh, and three young children to support. The pressure he's been under, and he's been quite wrongly criticised, perhaps, perhaps not carrying out as many public engagements as people require of him. Well, we know why now. And the poor chap, he's obviously stayed absolutely silent about it, carried on smiling, meeting, greeting, encouraging other people, supporting causes. And with all this going on in the background, incredible pressure on, on mm. him. Mm. Do you sound like you have a lot of respect for him, Jenny? Oh, I do. I've sort of watched him grow up and, um, you know, he's, I think he's a very decent um, man. He, um, you know, he's quite stubborn. He knows his mind. That's no bad thing in a, mm. in a future monarch, actually. But no one deserves this to happen to them. But let's hope, you know, this in a year or two will be history and all will be well. Indeed. Couldn't say any better myself. Jenny Bond, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, OK, now, let's see what my panel make of this. I'm still got author and broadcaster um, Claire Muldoon with me and, our, um, and journalist and broadcaster Albie Amacona with me as well. Both here. Now, obviously, it's we have been talking about this, and I, I, you know, I apologise we are talking about it again, but it's when I watched that on, on Friday, Kate Stoneman, I was incredibly moved, and I was surprised at how moved I was. I'm a journalist, I'm used to doing this sort of thing. Um, how do you think it's rolled out over the weekend, the way the country have reacted, the way the trolls have reacted, Albie? Well, I think some of the trolls have been suitably trolly. I think I saw a, a tweet from someone that seemed to get quite a lot of traction saying, oh, do, well, do we believe that Kate has cancer? But Twitter isn't real life and we've got to yeah. remember that. That broadcast will have been seen by millions of people across the country and millions of people around the world who themselves might have been impacted by cancer. And they will have seen that broadcast in the same way that I did. I had a family friend of mine die uh, in last year of cancer and think, gosh, how awful. Mm. But also think, 
gosh, I'm not alone, mm. and this is actually impacting one of the most important families in the world. And actually, the, the royals are, at the end of the day, just humans, and they're just people, and they go through the same things that we'll go through, which is why I think it's so important that they have been honest about these health issues that they have been facing, whether or not it's been the king, whether or not it's been the Princess of Wales. It's very different in the 21st century to how cancer was treated oh. in the past with the royals, yeah. where King George himself wasn't even told mm. that he had cancer at first, and it was completely hidden mm. from the public. Mm. It's a different century, we're treating it differently, and I think that's a good thing. And I, I think, Claire, don't you, that it's the positivity and getting people talking about mm. it more, the, the disease rather than what, what uh, Kate personally is going through. But that we are talking about cancer. It's not this, this really scary thing that, you know, it's, I think it's an instant <clears throat> death sentence anymore. What this has done is actually humanise the royal family, make the royal family real, mm. because, unfortunately, one in two of us will get cancer yes, in yeah. our lifetime. Yeah. Not right now, in our lifetime. That's the really important mm -hmm. part to, um, to, to change in this. Um, <clears throat> I, as a mother, I, was, I, I watched Kate, Kate, Princess of Wales, as very moving, mm -hmm. heartfelt speech to the nation. I found her commanding in her presence. But also, I think, it was an absolute PR disaster from Kensington Palace from start to finish. The doctored picture um, that had the, the, the pool um, from the international mm -hmm. time, uh, journalists and, and picture organisations, I think they could have held it, um, helped, a lot, helped her, helped the nation a lot more because the royal family are at the expense of the public purse. Mm. We do have, we know, we, we, we have to know. I think we've got a right to know what is going on. Now that we do, Let's help her by not talking about it. Let's help this mum of three, yeah. this wife of William, Prince of Wales, let's park their titles to the side and let the Princess of Wales, Kate Middleton, get together with her friends and trusted family, build a support network, which everyone that is going through cancer needs. Yeah. And I know I've been there as a support for many a friend that's been afflicted by this horrible, abhorrent, disgusting, life-taking disease. And it is no respecter of... No respect. ..status, privilege, uh, nope. wealth, anything. Thank you both very much. Uh, OK, I'm Dawn Neeson. This is GB News Sunday, and there's plenty more coming up on today's show. Should we feel proud of the England flag in the wake of the Nike shirt? Well, stop it, Scottish lady. <laughs> and why does it feel like the England flag is always the target? But first, here's the news with Erin Armstrong. Thanks, Dawn. Very good afternoon to you. It's 1.34 here in the GB newsroom. A new video released by Islamic State appears to corroborate its claim of responsibility for Friday's attack in Moscow. Russians are observing a national day of mourning after at least 133 people died. The new video released by IS shows gunmen filming themselves and moving through the concert hall searching for victims. We've chosen not to show it. It appears to contradict accusations by President Putin that Ukraine was involved, which Kiev denies. The White House says Islamic State's claim is credible and the Kremlin dismissed US warnings that an extremist attack may be imminent as propaganda. Well, it comes uh, after a series of uh, Russian attacks overnight in Ukraine. Residents of Kiev were forced to shelter in subway stations uh, while critical infrastructure in the western region near Lviv was also targeted, with one missile breaching the border with Poland, a NATO member. At least 10,000 civilians have been killed in Ukraine since Russia's invasion. The Prince and Princess of Wales have said they're enormously touched by messages of support from the public following Catherine's cancer diagnosis. On Friday, she revealed she's begun treatment. A statement from Kensington Palace said the couple are grateful that people understand their request for privacy. And the Chancellor's doubled down on his claim that £100,000 a year is not a huge salary. Jeremy Hunt says it doesn't go as far as you'd think for people in his Surrey constituency because of rising house prices and the cost of living. He also said he expects the general election to take place in October. For the latest story, sign up to GB News Alerts. You can scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts.
very much, Erin. Now, remember, you can get in touch about all the topics we've been discussing today by email me, very simple, gbviews at gbnews.com on your screens right now, or message me on our socials. We're at GB News. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Don't go too far. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Today looks much better, with plenty of sunshine across much of the UK, certainly a much brighter day than on Saturday. That's all thanks to a little ridge of high pressure moving in from the west, with low pressure now moving off uh, to the east of the UK. But notice further weather systems gathering out towards the west, and that will turn things more unsettled once again during the week ahead. Back to the detail now for the rest of the day. So plenty of sunshine around, just one or two showers feeding down from the north or northwest, particularly across northern parts of Scotland. Still a bit wintry here across the hilltops. But with lighter winds generally, more in the way of sunshine around, it should feel warmer out and about with temperatures up to 12 or 13 Celsius. 13 in London is 55 in Fahrenheit. As we go through the evening and during the overnight period, towards the north and east we'll see a lot of clear weather, the showers fading, turning quite chilly here with those clear spells. When we go towards the west, it's starting to turn pretty wet, particularly across Northern Ireland, parts of Wales and the southwest of England, some heavy bursts of rain in places here by Monday morning. Temperatures down to two or three Celsius towards the north and east, so I say there will be a touch of frost by Monday morning. Was well, that towards the west, those temperatures start to rise, but that heralds a pretty wet day out across the west, and particularly down towards the southwest of England, could be some quite heavy rain at times here and notice as that rain moves into colder air across Scotland it will start to turn to snow particularly on modest hills above about two or three hundred meters could be a fair bit of snow here tomorrow night with some heavy rain towards the east and southeast of the country too brighter skies down towards the southeast with 12 degrees I'm Michelle Jubery and I'm not here to tell you what to think I'd much rather hear what you have to say so, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back. Hope you're having a wonderful Sunday afternoon out there. This is GB News Sunday. It is Sunday and I'm Dawn Neeson. Um, I'm on your telly, online and on digital radio. Now, an official review into social cohesion is set to recommend that protests should be banned outside schools. The review is led by Dame Sarah Khan, highlights the case of a teacher who was forced into hiding after showing pupils at Batley Grammar School a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad. You must remember the story. It was huge at the time. The incident sparked large demonstrations at the school and three years on, the teacher remains in hiding, suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Dame Sarah is expected to issue a damning indictment of the police force in the area, school leadership and the local council for their handling of the matter. Her report is expected to re recommend a series of measures, including a ban on protests within 150 metres of schools. Right, uh, 
OK, um, right, OK, I'm going to go... We, we, we did have a commentator on this, but I think it's frozen. Frozen in time, as it were. So I'm going to talk to the panel about mm. this one. Um, Claire Muldoon mm -hmm. and Albie Amacona are still with me. Now, I'm stunned, Claire, that this is three years mm. ago. Mm. This poor teacher was head of RE at Batley Dr Grammar School. It, they've been doing these lessons for... for Two years previously, years. until March 2021, suddenly, when he lost his job. Suddenly, there was this hate mob, mm -hmm. other word for describing mm -hmm. it, outside mm -hmm. the school. And he, three years later, was still in hiding in mm -hmm. fear for his life, his, his partner's wife and their, and their children. children. What do you make of it? I think I, it's, I'm absolutely disgusted by it. I really, really am. And it was male Muslim protesters that were protesting with the Charlie Hebden cartoon that was shown in class. Mm -hmm. Now, this, car this class was being taken by the same teacher in Batley Grammar for two years previously mm -hmm. until March 2021 last year when the mob ruled. Mm -hmm. And the mob ruled that he must leave. He was ousted from his post with no care, no due diligence, no reform at all in terms of Batley Grammar um, Academy. I think this is just disgusting. We have let our staff down in this country. Mm -hmm. And until we start opening up the doors to good, honest teaching, good, honest policing of events, I don't think we can move forward. I really don't. So, Dame Sarah Khan is an independent social cohesion advisor. And this is going to be damning. This is actually... She, well, it uh, is damning. The, reveal, the, the review will reveal how the Batley teacher felt totally isolated, mm -hmm. abandoned and suicidal. Suicidal. Owing to a lack of support from the agencies that should have protected him. Now, the fact that we are talking about this three years on, this poor man and his family... Has no arrests hiding. have been made, Don. No, no arrests have been made. What do you make of this, Albie? I mean, this, she's right, isn't she? Dame Sarah is right. We do need some protection from people rent a mob outside schools in this way. Well, irrespective of what my opinions are on this case, and I do think it is a, a tragic uh, situation that this teacher is, is in hiding and doesn't feel that he can do his job... Dame Sarah Khan is actually quite a divisive figure within the British Muslim community, and there are a lot of people who don't actually think <clears throat> she applies things fairly to British Muslims. And there will be British Muslims, perhaps watching and listening to us now, Dawn, who will find any depiction of the Prophet Muhammad very, very insulting and offensive to their religion. And anyone that knows anything about religious education knows that. Now, whether or not that should lead to someone being in hiding, or whether or not that should lead to something like the Charlie Hebdo attacks in Paris all of those years ago, those awful terrorist attacks, Absolutely not. Of course, that should not happen. But there is a cultural sensitivity here that perhaps people need to be more underst understanding of in the multicultural society that we're living in. I, I completely disagree because that Charlie Hebdo, Hebdo cartoon uh, was, an, was an, a way in for people to discuss things. And that's the tool that this teacher used to discuss mm. blasphemy, to, dis, to discuss uh, disrespect in religions, and to discuss, um, uh, you know, to, to involve. I mean, if you look at the the Batley Grammar website at the moment, they've got, so they changed it in September 2023, the guidance in dealing with diversity, inclusion and equality. And it goes against the grain about everything that's happened to this teacher. And I'm sorry, but we are supposed to be a Christian country, although we are a very secular society, the buck stops here with, with, um, I, um, with schools. And I think it is absolutely... A, an abomination what's happened to him. And she is right. I do think we have to ban protests outside schools. Let's see what Especially. Our, 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 our guest says on this. Um, joining me now is social policy analysis, uh, Dr Rakim Hassan. Uh, Rakim, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. You've heard what our panellists have said. Uh, what do you make of uh, what Sarah Khan's report is going to say? Well, I think in terms of what took place at Batley Grammar School, I think what we saw there was a fundamental lack of lo uh, local leadership, Dawn. And I think that, uh, irrespective of one's view, I, I, may, I would consider myself to be a socially conservative Muslim. I think we have to understand that we are a country where we don't actually have blasphemy laws in place. They were, they were largely disused and then ultimately removed from the statute books. Now, of course, I think that in a multi-faith democracy such as ours, we have to have conversations in terms of mutual um, understanding, encouraging mutual tolerance, and that has to be a common commitment which spans all faiths and none. But I think that what we really need to talk about here is that when it comes to school protests, are, are very careful in terms of undermining 
freedom of expression mm. and assembly. But I think it's very clear that there is an intimidating atmosphere which is created outside of schools. Mm -hmm. And if parents have issues in terms of the content <clears throat> of what's being taught to their children in schools, that that's done in a cooperative and peaceful way. Obviously, there is a free speech element here, but the mob, and that's what they were, we saw at this, the school in this particular case, and the mob we have seen outside the Houses of Parliament recently, outside our um, MPs, our um, private homes as well, mm. and outside other schools. I mean, there was one in my area in East London recently um, about the uh, Palestine-Gaza issue. Um, there has to be some there has to be some line drawn in the sand about how far people can go to 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 have their free speech and make a point but rather than these mobs descending on people it's not just schools we're talking about here it could be also you know uh, universities all sorts of institutions mm. No, 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 absolutely. And we have to make the point that educational institutions, they have to be hubs of critical thought. I mean, that, that, that's at the heart of it. And of course, there's discussions to be had in terms of how parents interact with schools, if they have issues with being taught to their children, especially when it comes to uh, religious education. I certainly have issues with creeping forms of radical transgenderism in the state school system. But the point is, is that if parents are disillusioned with what's being taught to their children or they have issues with it, that they cooperate with the schools in a, in a, in a very decent way and that protest that they do not descend into um, atmospheres of intimidation, which could be uh, particularly uncomfortable for teachers at those schools. Rakeem, just one thing, touching slightly on what um, Albi said just now, the sensitivity mm. around the Islamic faith in particular. Um, meanwhile, we have had... Christians arrested for silently praying outside of abortion mm. clinics. Absolutely. Is there a different way? Are the faiths handled in a different way? Well, I, I think that that's something that does concern me because ultimately if you live in a pluralistic society and that we have a commitment to religious pluralism, that, that, that there's no space for preferential treatment. And one of your guests did talk about that we're a Christian country. I would also make the point that I would argue that it's many British Muslims, in my view, that truly represent what we would consider to be traditional Christian values. So I think that in terms of religious pluralism, that has to involve a reconnection with our Christian heritage and traditions. And I think that's been lost in the mainstream over time. Mm, indeed, there's a long way to go. Uh, Rakiba San, thank you very much for joining us afternoon. Appreciate your time. Now, uh, Batley Grammar School claimed that support for the teachers involved was a priority from the start and it had made counselling available to the teacher for several months. While an investigation by the school's trust later cleared the teacher of wrongdoing, it found the use of the image in a lesson was inappropriate. Make it that what you will and let us know what you think. Uh, I'm Dawn Neeson. This is GB News Sunday. Uh, does it feel like the England flag is always a target, whilst others aren't maybe so much? Discussing that and more, the row, uh, row over the Three Lions news shirt next. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Don't go too far. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. Absenteeism and parents whose children miss a week or more of school face increased fines in a government drive to tackle absence. This is another one of those government policies which has done nothing to improve the education of our children. Mm. In fact, since this was originally introduced some 10 years ago, the educational standards for our children, the 11-year-olds who can't read when they go up to primary school, have got worse and worse and worse. So it's not working. So what do they do? They just increase the fine, like that may make it work. Most of the parents who get fined are taking their kids up so they can take them on a holiday before the holiday companies push the prices up. Mm. And frankly, as a parent, if I've got a £600 discount on my holiday versus a £60 fine, hmm. I'm mm. going to go for the 60 You'll suffer fine. the fine. Yeah. yeah. Let's not forget the other huge absence that children had uh, recently were, uh, during COVID. Mm. Schools were closed for months and months on end. Online learning was really not making up for that. Mm. So how could, you know, it's very difficult for the government to say it was fine for us to take your kids out of school for, for months, but if you take them off for a few days to go to Disneyland, then you are the worst parent ever and you should be... But also, be it's, it's, it's the pandemic that, that caused some of the problems with absenteeism now. Absolutely. Because the mental health issues that some of these children now have. And there are tens of thousands of children, they, they call them ghost children, that have simply disappeared from the school register. So it that would be nice. It's, it's really, really 
scary situation. Um, I'm not seeing that the government is, you know, taking great measures. Well, to I think that. one of Punishing. their plans is to have a national register, hmm. which, 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 which would help with that. Which would definitely help. But I think it, it's it's almost it's. You can't. Well, they can't deal with the real problem, so they're going after it's... actually perfectly, you know, decent parents who are just taking the odd day off, you know, for to save money, frankly. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, nine to eleven p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it. And I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. proud to be English. You may not be after England's performance in the defeat when it wasn't that bad against Brazil, but of course we should be proud to be English. So why is our flag treated differently to pretty much every other flag? I'm of course talking about the ongoing row over the England shirt with Nike or the appearance of the St George's Cross. Joining me now is historian and broadcaster Rafe Hedel-Mancou. Rafe, thank you very much. What is wrong with being English, Rafe? Nothing at all. Um, you know, um, as uh, Cecil Rhodes once said, remember, sir, you're an Englishman and have therefore won first place in the lottery of life. Uh, and I think we should remember that. But these culture war attacks are directed, you know, much more against England than Scotland and Wales. And I think, you know, Winston Churchill put it best, as he always does, when he said, there is a forgotten, nay, almost forbidden word, which means more to me than any other. And that word is England. And that's truer today now than I think than ever before, because, you know, whilst everyone else today is told to celebrate their identity, obsess about their identity and their heritage and their culture, there's one identity that's frowned upon, and that's England being English and Englishness. You know, no one criticizes the Scots or the Welsh with their patriotic fervor. In fact, they celebrate flying their flags and waving their flags. When they do it, it's called progressive nationalism, when we do it in England, it's called, race, it's called racism. You know, there are lots of flags flying in Cardiff and Edinburgh, but the flag of St George wasn't even flying from City Hall in London, which is the capital of England. And when Ken Livingston gave funding for a St Patrick's Day parade in London, he refused to do one for St George's Day. But the English should be proud because no other country in the world, with the exception perhaps of Italy, has influenced the world as much. I often say that Britain invented the modern world. In truth, it's actually England that created the modern world. With the English language, you know, the modern global lingua franca, the industrial revolution, capitalism, England didn't invent, but England spread capitalism around the world. It's role in the scientific revolution, the enlightenment, the common law, mother of parliament at Westminster. Rafe, the Westminster thank you. Model. Rafe, Rafe, sorry, love, we're running out of time. Thank you so much for joining right. us. And be proud to be English is the message. Right, uh, time to go for a quick break. Don't go too far, okay. though. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. We've seen a much quieter day across the UK today, more in the way of sunshine than on Saturday, but things will turn more unsettled again during the week ahead. It's this little ridge of high pressure that's been moving in from the west, quieting the weather down, but notice low pressure gathering again out towards the west, and so this will be turning things more unsettled through uh, tonight into Monday. As we go through the evening and overnight period then, the showers towards the north and east of the UK will tend to ease. We'll see lots of clear weather around, and here it will turn quite chilly with a touch of frost by Monday morning. Whereas out towards the west and southwest, that rain is gathering. Some of the rain starting to turn quite heavy by the morning on Monday, accompanied by quite blustery winds too. But notice an increase in temperature out towards the west as that rain arrives. Into Monday then, 
Uh, plenty of bright weather towards the north and east of the UK. One or two showers up towards the far northeast. Still a bit wintry in nature here, but elsewhere it's all about the wet and windy weather moving in from the west and southwest. So many western and southwestern parts of the UK, particularly down towards the southwest, seeing some very heavy rain at times on Monday. And as that rain moves into colder air in Scotland, we could see some snow falling, particularly during the afternoon into the overnight period. And again, some of that snow above about two or 300 metres could be quite heavy in nature, with heavy rain towards the south and east of Scotland. That sets the scene for a very unsettled day across Scotland on uh, Tuesday. Again, heavy snow across the hills, heavy rain towards lower levels. Elsewhere, a mix of sunshine and showers. And that sets the scene for the rest of the week ahead. All the areas seeing unsettled weather. Showers are longer spells of rain, with temperatures near average. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Time is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 double t UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hello you there, welcome to GB News Sunday. Hope you're having a wonderful afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us this lunchtime. I'm Dawn Neeson and for the next hour I'll be keeping you company on telly, online and on digital radio. Cracking hour coming up for you. Chancellor Jeremy Hunt has admitted on GB News he wants to scrap national insurance, but could this rescue his party and how would they pay for it? Reports suggest China has targeted senior UK politicians in a string of dangerous cyber attacks, spurring a crisis meeting in Westminster. And Shamima Begum is one of 19 jihadi brides being held in detention in Syria. We'll be debating whether they should be able to return. But funnily enough, this show isn't all about me, it's about you. 
We need your views on what we're talking about and anything else you want to have a chat about, to be honest with you. Very, very simple. Email me on gbviews at gbnews.com or message me on our socials. We're at GB News. But first, let's get those news headlines with Erin Armstrong. Thanks, Dawn, and a very good afternoon to you. It is a minute past two. I'm Aaron Armstrong. Islamic State's released new footage, which appears to back up the terror group's claim it was behind Friday's attack in Moscow that killed 133 people. It's Russia's worst attack for two decades. The new video released by IS showed gunmen filming themselves and moving through the venue searching for people. We've chosen not to show it. President Putin has suggested, without evidence, Ukraine was involved which Kyiv says is absurd. The White House has described the attack as heinous and Islamic State as a common terrorist enemy that must be defeated. The sound there of sirens in Ukraine, which was hit by a series of Russian attacks overnight. Residents were forced to shelter in the subway stations. Missiles were also aimed at critical infrastructure in the western region near Lviv, uh, one missile breached the border with Poland, which is a NATO member. At least 10,000 civilians have been killed in Ukraine since Russia's invasion. The Prince and Princess of Wales have said they're enormously touched by the kind messages of support they've received. Catherine announced her cancer diagnosis on Friday and revealed she's started preventative chemotherapy. A statement from Kensington Palace also said the couple are grateful the public understand their request for privacy. The Chancellor has defended the government's record on affordable housing after claiming £100,000 a year is not a huge salary. Uh, Jeremy Hunt reiterated that it doesn't go as far as you would think for people in his Surrey constituency uh, because of higher house prices and the rising cost of living. The average home now costs around eight times the average income. It was half that in the 1990s. The Chancellor told Camilla Tomini lower taxes will make a difference. The average house price is in that part of the world £670,000. Mm. If you've got a mortgage, if you're paying childcare, um, what looks like a very high salary doesn't go as far as you might think it would. If you look at the average salary in this country, £35,000, um, they have been feeling the pinch and those people will see their tax bills go down by £900 this yeah. year. If you look at people on an even lower salary, uh, the lowest legally payable salary, the national living wage, because I've increased that to £11.44, they will see if they're working full-time, their income go up by £1,800. However, the Labour Party chair, Annalise Dodd, says tax rises are to blame, and she promised changes under a Labour government. You know, there's a big difference, Camilla, between what Labour is setting out, especially on taxation, and what we're seeing under the Conservatives. We've seen taxes going up 25 times under the Conservatives. Our instinct is always to make sure that working people are not paying the price for government mistakes. That's what's happened, I'm afraid, under the Conservatives. So, of course, our approach would always be to try and reduce that impact on working people. We've seen the opposite, I'm afraid, under recent Conservative governments. Chilling levels of harassment are posing a serious threat to social cohesion. That's according to an independent government adviser. A review led by Dame Sarah Khan will be published tomorrow, showing more than 75% of the public feel they can't speak their mind. It suggests many people feel society's become more divisive and cites the case of a teacher who went into hiding after showing a caricature of the Prophet Muhammad during a class. Dame Sarah says journalists, teachers and people working in the arts are subjected to severe levels of abuse, often resulting in self-censorship. It's understood the report will recommend a series of measures, including a ban on protests within 150 metres of schools. And China's believed to be targeting Britain with a wave of cyber attacks aimed at disrupting the democratic system. The Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowden, is expected to warn MPs tomorrow about state-backed interference in Britain's political system by Chinese hackers. It's understood some Chinese officials have been summoned by Parliament's Director of Security in relation to the cyber threats. And it comes a year uh, after a report found Britain is unprepared for a large-scale ransomware attack because of a lack of investment. 
Finally, Simon Harris is set to become Ireland's youngest Prime Minister after no other candidates to lead his Fine Gael party came forward. It follows the surprise resignation of Leo Varadkar on Wednesday for what he described as personal and political reasons. At the age of 37, Mr Harris will become Ireland's youngest Taoiseach. He's expected to be formally elected in April after the Easter recess. Well, you can scan the QR code on your screen for GB News Alerts or find more details on those on our website. But now it's back to Dawn. Thank you very much, Erin. Let's get straight into today's story, shall we? Chancellor Jeremy Hunt has stood by his claim that £100,000 a year is not a huge salary. Camilla Tomini pressed him on this earlier today. Here's what he said. A hundred grand isn't a large amount of money to earn? Well, um, I was talking to a lady who was explaining to me the average house prices in that part of the world £670,000. Mm. If you've got a mortgage, if you're paying childcare, um, what looks like a very high salary doesn't go as far as you might think it would. And, <clears throat> but you know, but when... that's under 40 <clears throat> years of Tory rule, isn't it? I mean, 100 grand is, what, four times, more or less, the average salary in this country. So that's a hell of a lot of money to earn, isn't it? Why, why are people on 100 grand feeling that they don't have enough money under a Conservative government? The reason is because um, we've been through a very difficult period. We've had a pandemic, we've had an energy crisis. And by the way, it's not just people on that salary, it's people mm. on all salaries. Hmm. I tell that a lot when I listen to him. Uh, the Chancellor was also asked about his future tax and spend plans and he confirmed that he wants to abolish national insurance completely. But yes, I would like to bring the absolute levels of tax down. I absolutely. Mean, and I've started on that path. would you like to scrap NI? Completely. Yes, I would like that. I mean, when, employees... can you, when can you imagine being able to do that? If, if you offered that, for instance, in a fiscal event before the election, which was obviously be good electioneering, when would that feasibly be able to take place? Well, I can't responsibly promise a date because it depends on all sorts of things, including, you know, what Putin does in Ukraine and mm. international energy prices. But what I can say is that uh, for two fiscal events in a row, for the autumn statement and the budget, I have been able to make a significant cut in personal taxation without increasing borrowing, without risking our public services. And a Conservative government will go further because we've shown we can do it and we'll continue on that journey. Hmm, hmm. I told you to do a lot of that. Uh, joining me now is political commentator Stephen Carlton Woods. Stephen, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Camilla did a cracking job interviewing Jeremy Hunt, um, but I'm just hearing a lot of white noise here still. I mean, what, what do you make of what he said? First of all, let's put the... Uh controversy for the £100,000 um, in context, really. So he was talking about a constituent in his area, uh, a, a, an area called Godalming, which is about 30 miles southwest of central London. And actually, the average house price has gone up a bit from what uh, Jeremy said, just under a touch under £700,000 at the moment. So I think uh, he was uh, extremely... This was the extreme focused example really of his area and this particular person and i think it would be see it would be absolutely ludicrous to suggest that such things uh, to suggest such a thing in, in a deprived area we know that as they were saying before it's four times the, the average uh, around the uk so i think it's taken out of context slightly going into that uh, thing about the hundred thousand pounds but it was a true example of what the area he's represented no, but, I mean, obviously, you know, the Tories, there's an election coming up, they want to win, but that, how's that going to go down with someone living in one of the Red Wall constituencies on an average income of, say, £30,000 a year? They're just going to think the Tories are hideously out of touch with what real, ordinary people are going through in this country. Well, that's, that's exactly what I'm trying to get at. Let's get this back in context. He was on about his constituency, and, I, like I said, it'd be absolutely ludicrous to suggest that for any other parts of the country that's particularly deprived areas mm. in the north. And one of the other um, policies he was talking about was the um, triple lock on pensions. Uh, that is going to be now part of the Tory manifesto. We've got a lot of response from viewers on that one, saying, you know, they've worked hard all their lives, they've paid income tax and national insurance, they deserve this. Do you think that will be a vote winner for the Conservatives? 
Well, there's a lot more to take into consideration. Just that the triple lock's been part of their um, manifesto for the last two co uh, general elections. So when we look at things like inflation, I mean, don't forget, he's, uh, Jeremy's only been in office for 18 months. And when he came into office, inflation was actually 11%. And it's just gone down to 3.4%. So part of his last budget, when he put uh, 4p off uh, national insurance, that on average, if we take the national average, that's £900 a year saving per person. So there's other things as well. He didn't want to be borrowing more money. So when he was faced, he was either faced with extended borrowing uh, to cut taxes or keep the status quo to reduce borrowing, and the latter probably the more sensible choice, really. Um, but, I mean, a lot of people are saying, should he have gone further with that as well? So he had to make sensible choices. So despite fiscal dragging, they managed to reduce the amount of tax people pay hey. compared to forecasts by the OBS and by the uh, IFS. So uh, I think he was doing the responsible thing, really. So keeping that in the manifesto about, um, about the triple lock, well, I agree with that. And then the next thing you were talking about is scrapping NI mm. uh, contributions. Now, I see this more as an aspiration than anything else. But uh, it also, I think, gives a, a, an indicator that they might, they're actually believing they could win the next election. And that's why they're not being so uh, uh, forceful with putting this in a manifesto. It's, been, it's lingering in the air. And that's why I say it's more of an aspiration than uh, something they really will do. And Stephen, that's what we're hearing a lot from both parties, isn't it? Our, um, Stephen uh, Carlton Woods, there, thank you very much for joining thank us you. on the aspirations of the Conservative Party. Not policies or promises, they're aspirations. Heard that from Labour as well, haven't we? Uh, now, I'm joined by GB News presenter Albie Amacona and broadcaster and journalist Claire Muldoon. Um, but we're not actually discussing that show, we're actually talking about China. Are we really? Yes, we are. We are talking about China, because reports suggest China has targeted senior UK <coughs> politicians in a string of dangerous cyber attacks, spurring a crisis meeting in Westminster. Four MPs who are all critical of Beijing have been called to an urgent briefing by Parliament's Director of Security, Oliver Dowden. Tomorrow this is happening, as set to announce this to Parliament. Let's, set, let's see what you make of this one. Um, mm. Mm. I'm not surprised. China. Mm. I'm really not surprised. Uh, they are a massive economy, um, emerging markets. They've just got their finger in every single pie. And don't forget MI6 or MI, uh, MI6 and MI5, the domestic uh, intelligence bureau, actually have had on their lists, on their radar, Chinese people um, in trying to infiltrate government at quite a high level. Yeah, I mean, we, we've, had, we've been hearing this story quite a bit over the last couple of years, haven't we, Albie, about how much China are a threat, not just the UK, other European countries and certainly America are taking um, action on this one. Um, it, it, but it sounds all a bit James Bond to mm. me at the moment, I have to admit. What do you make of this It does all tomorrow? sound quite a bit James Bond. And I think what Oliver Dowden is going to be announcing is essentially what sounds like a bit of a retaliation um, from the, some of these cyber attacks that we're seeing on high profile MPs who have taken stances against China. People like uh, Tim Loughton, for example. We also know that former Prime Minister Liz Truss took a very strong stance against China during her leadership election and had a very short time in government. But China as a country is difficult, I think, for Western governments to get their head around. Because, yes, in one sense it is a threat, but in another sense it's an important economic partner. Mm. And I think Western governments have got to be careful not to over-egg things. There are a lot of people in industry who think things like the Huawei ban, who they produce telecommunications oh, gosh, equipment, yes, remember, was yeah. over the top. Yeah. There are lots of people who think the TikTok ban in the United States of America is over the top. So there is this tussle going on between the economic interests of the West and the security interests of the West, and the two agendas don't always marry together nicely. It's very interesting, Claire, that at the same time as this meeting has happened with Oliver Dowden, mm -hmm. a Chinese company that makes electric, electric vehicle batteries for BMW is 
on the cusp of investing billions of pounds into building Britain's biggest gigafactory. So the Chinese are going to be hosting, uh, owning most of our industry. So it's a bit of a contradiction going on. Well, Britain's no longer a manufacturing country. That's all been by sent by the wayside, you know. And we are looking to China. That's what I said at the beginning. It's such a massive, massive market. And it's, we're still giving aid to China. You know, it's, it just doesn't add up. But it, as I'll be quite rightly said, in my view, the <clears throat> absolute balance between security and the need for manufacturing infrastructure and the need for goods and services is, is a very, very, it's a very balanced tightrope. It's incredibly difficult to balance. It, it is, it is <clears throat> tricky, isn't it? And, and it's not just this country. It's many countries around Europe now. It's that balance between investment and also keeping China at a safe distance, especially with everything that else is going on in the world. I mean, what we've seen happening in Russia recently. Well, precisely. I think there are there's a growing bunch of people on the perhaps more more more, more China hawk side of the argument that really want us to treat China in a similar way almost to how we treat Russia. But then you'll have people on the economic side of the argument saying, well, actually, if we treat China like Russia, that would be an act of economic self-harm. But then what would also be an act of economic self-harm if we were not to be tough on China with the prospect that they might invade Taiwan? Because Taiwan is a region of the world which manufactures most of the semiconductors which go into a lot of our digital devices that power things in this studio. And that would cause huge economic harm for the country. So. It's a very tightrope that we're walking on here, and I'm not sure if we've got the balance right at the well, moment. Well, Taiwan is a very, very hot potato, because don't mm. forget, Biden sent over um, um, a high member of, the, of his team to... It wasn't Kamala Harris, uh, to see what was going on there. I know that the RAF uh, are flying over parts of Taiwan using Ukraine to go over the, the airspace. I mean, it's an absolute minefield. It really, really is. And it's something that's quite... I mean, I, do you know what I really want? I would prefer if Britain were holding China to account on net zero the way they are ordinary people in this country. That's that would, that would, in my eyes, help everything. That's a very fair point because the argument always is sort of like, okay, I've got to install a heat pump. Meanwhile, China are building new coal power fire stations, literally as we speak. But how does Britain hold China to account on net zero? It's almost it a bit can't. like saying Britain should hold America to account on net zero. We can't hold these big countries to account on net we zero. We can talk about it, though, We I'll can be. talk about it and we should talk about it. But I would also say, if we're talking about environmentalism in China, China is the biggest market for EVs. Now, look, there, is there more China can do to get us to net zero? Of course there is. But there are areas of their economy where China is actually further ahead with the net zero agenda than the rest of the world is. Just quickly mm. on the TikTok issue, I've just noticed here that uh, um, TikTok estimated to contribute 1.6 billion to the UK economy in 2022. And that's just the UK economy. That's not the global no, economy. No, that's the thing. So, I mean, sort of like, you know, the fact that, you know, we are, we are trying to mm. go down the road in, in several government offices of banning mm. TikTok... Mm. Is, is, is that a good thing or a bad thing, Claire? Well, I don't, I'm not on TikTok, but it's a very... It's I'm, a very, I'm way very, too old, thankfully. It's a very useful tool that uh, the youth of today use uh, because the, the advertising revenue and the advertising streams for products and services on this app is huge, absolutely huge. But the, but, but the people what know what they're talking about with this sort of thing, they say that, you know, you can, China can get so much information from TikTok because they own the app, basically. So I think when it, young comes to, yeah. when it comes to TikTok, I think we've got, to be, we've got to be quite careful not to imagine things which are possible. Is it theoretically possible, were the Chinese government to want to get information from us through TikTok? That might be the case. But realistically, there are so many layers of corporate governance and so many layers of international regulations that would make that sort of thing very difficult to do in practice. Would it actually happen? I think it's probably quite unlikely. That being said, I do think it's quite prudent of the United King, uh, sorry, of the United States of America to basically say, well, if you're going to keep TikTok in the United States of America, ByteDance, which is the company that owns TikTok, has got to sell their stake in the company company to a US company, because that's a, a massive cash grab for the American economy. So it's actually quite prudent. Yeah. If it's not on security, I think it's more about money. Yeah, I've, just, I've just remembered as well, Claire, that Grant Shapps is on TikTok, which mm. is another good reason possibly not to Yeah, was that, that when he was a car salesman or now or even when? Now, you know, still, I what? think. Um, oh. Can't keep up. They've all had so many jobs. Right, Grant uh, Shapps has many means. For all the best analysis and opinion on that story and more, go to our website, gbnews.com. Now, 
it's time for the great British giveaway. We've got a shopping spree, a garden gadget bundle and £12,345 in cash. Here's as it can be all yours. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax free cash. Text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at GBNews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Okay, my guests have both got their phones out at this very moment. Yeah. You're not allowed to enter, by the way, <laughs> but you two, you two got can out there, right? I was just entering, I'm guilty. <laughs> right, I'm John Neeson, and this is GB News Sunday, and there's loads more coming up on today's show, <coughs> including whether we should let jihadi brides like Shamima Begum return to the UK. Shocking numbers and an exclusive coming up on that one. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Co. Weekdays from 6 p.m. You think this country needs new gas power stations? Apparently, this will all be about trying to get some form of energy security. Rishi Sunak has upset people today with this suggestion. People saying that actually this would do more damage to climate change uh, than it would do good. Where are you on it, Richard? Uh, I'll tell you exactly where. We need a lot more gas power stations and nuclear power stations because quite often the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Last week, we imported 16% of all our electricity because we haven't got enough capacity in the UK and we're now totally over-reliant on renewables. Um, the part of the problem is the lack of storage capacity, which mm. the government has finally got round to addressing. I think this as backup is actually quite a sensible idea. But they are not doing anything, as far as I can tell. At the moment, it will be retrofitted to have storage capability, which seems to be utterly bonkers. I mean, anyone who's got solar panels, um, you know, you know very well you're storing up energy. So it's about storage as much as production. And they could have gone, you know, 20 years ago, we could have had nuclear power. You know, we, we could have done more. We haven't looked far enough ahead in the future, and we are in grave danger of making the same mistake. I mean, the other side of this is what is the difference going to be blackouts are you know they're irritating and irritating it'd be disastrous well, it would destroy our now. economy well they would be now but you know um some of us remember three-day weeks and things like that and in fact you know i grew up thinking that everybody had you know at least a couple of days a week when they had to eat off a primer stove and things. This is, again, I don't want to harp on, but this is one of the problems in the politics in our country, isn't it? So many politicians, they're just thinking election cycles. Absolutely. They just think, what can I do and yeah. say to get my own backside re-elected uh, at the next general election? They're not always looking ahead. Uh, actually, politics aside, what is genuinely the best thing for this country? 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel.
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back to GB News Sunday with me, Dawn Neeson, on your tellies, online and on digital radio. Now, this is a shocker. It's been revealed that Shamima Begum is just one of 19 jihadi brides being held in a detention camp in Syria. The Mail on Sunday reports the commander at the Al Raj camp has said there are 19 British women and 35 children living there. The figure is higher than previously thought, and one of the women has begged to be allowed to return to the UK. Now, Canada and Germany have allowed jihadi brides to return, and America are putting the pressure on us to do the same. But should we? Now, remember, this moves it on from just Shamima Begum. 19 women, 35 children, British. Joining me now is filmmaker and journalist Andrew Drury to explain what's going on here. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Really appreciate your time. Now, this is our, um, a story in the Mail on Sunday today. What do you make of this story? Oh, right, OK, uh, we have lost Andrew, unfortunately. Um, this is um, a, a shocking story, Claire. I was surprised by this. We, you know, we, we've discussed Shamima Begin, so we're blue in the face. I mean, she's been stripped of her nationality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But these are new figures today. 19 British women being held in this camp, 35 children. The director of the camp is saying we should take them back because we, by not doing so, are encouraging radicalism. What do you make of this? Well, should we have them back? No, we shouldn't. Um, when Sanjeev uh, Javid uh, stripped Shamima Begum of her British nationality uh, and citizenship, he did so not to make her stateless, because at the time she was born of Bangladeshi parents, so Bangladesh, then the burden of proof was on them to prove that she wasn't a, a Bangladeshi um, citizen. The issue for Shamima Begum, as I understand it now, has arisen because Bangladesh are saying, no, I'm sorry, she's not ours. And her Canadian uh, husband... Uh, is Canada are saying no through the marriage because she was married young, under the age or that we would allow marriage to happen. She's not our responsibility either. Shamima Begum is the face of um, the, the jihadist movement at the time mm. of these brides. And don't forget, she was sent to recruit young women. Now we're faced with the issue of 19 women, but not only that, it's the children. Mm. It's the children that I feel very sorry for because they're fatherless, they're there with their mothers who appear to be stateless. Um, so we need to work out whose issue and whose burden these women actually are. And we can't dehumanise them. Whether or not we think they are, they've committed treason, whether or not we, we think they're traitors of the country, I think we've got a fundamental duty of care to the children and to these women as well to hear their stories but notwithstanding the fact I am not, the, I am not a big fan of Shamima Begum and I would not personally sign off in her papers to come back and live in this country. Albie, how about you? Well, I've got a lot of sympathy for what Claire has just said, but I think one of the most interesting interventions on this issue has actually been from our colleague Jacob Rees-Mogg, who vehemently disagrees with what Claire has had to say and actually thinks that it is right that, that Britain takes the responsibility for Shamima Begum, that she shouldn't be left stateless and that she should come back to the United Kingdom and face justice in that, in this country. And I think a lot of people are quite surprised to hear Jacob have that opinion, but it's actually something he's been very consistent on. And I think... A lot of what you were saying, Claire, you were saying, you know, she shouldn't be stateless. Well, she is currently stateless. So what, what would you say to someone like Jacob who says, in a situation like this, this woman is stateless, the children are so in a refugee camp, they should come back and face justice in the I UK? I think we can bring in our guests now, can we? Um, Andrew Drury, who... Yeah, Andrew. Andrew Drury, who has been to these camps, has talked to these women, um, interviewed Shamima Begin several times. Um, now, this is uh, um, a, a new numbers, and we're not used to these numbers, and it's a first-ever interview with a lady called Wajda Rashid from Leeds, who is another jihadi bride. What do you make of this story, Andrew? 
Um, funny enough, I was woke up by your message this morning and I saw the paper. <laughs> Ironically, it's a stolen story by me. Um, I had that story roughly about two years ago, but Reprieve, the apologetic um, human rights group, prevented us from putting the story out on a brother. Oh. So Wadge is just another person um, in that camp alongside another 19 girls. And also I was listening to your, your guest there talking about Shamima Began and the children. Let me tell you, what about my, my always, my, I would say, what about the victims? Shamima Began was most definitely his butt, which means she was part of the morality police. What rights have those victims got? We talk about her all the time, but never about the victims. I was in refugee camps talking to the victims. Um, I don't think they'll feel so sorry as we, or, or, or some of your, your guests might feel sorry for her. And let's talk about the kids. These kids are trained as the new generation of ISIS. When I went there, they were chucking rocks at us. So let's not feel so apologetic about them either. Andrew, what do you make of the fact that America have put pressure on us to take these um, jihadi brides and their children back? The director of the camps in, in question um, are putting pressure on us to take them back. What do you make of that attitude? Well, the attitude for the Americans is normal American because they've got a girl there that they've also made stateless that they're refusing to take back. So it's a bit ironic that they've come out and said we should take ours back because Shamima's best friend is a, was an American citizen. So maybe they should take theirs back too, if that's what their case. Look, I base my feelings about Shamima about actually, actually knowing her. I'm probably one of the only people that mm, does know her. Mm. And her character is not that nice. Mm. Let's be honest. I mean, why are we so keen to bring her back? Well, for what reason? Mm. Why are we so due back? Oh, because she was once ours or whatever. She didn't want to be um, British. She gave up her passport by leaving this country. She never once tried to escape or get back. It's only now it's a bit hot there or a bit cold there. It's uncomfortable. She doesn't like it anymore. She wants to come back. Now, we, we have been told um, that, you know, if we knew what the security forces knew about some of these women, we wouldn't want them back. Do you think they would be a threat to the British public? Um, well, she's, for a bit for, she's a threat for what she stood for. And let me know, we do know what she's done. We do know that she was his, but there's enough evidence, enough witnesses about the suicide, suicide, suicide vest. Mm. And this is a woman, remember, that said the Manchester bombing was legitimate. Remember that? And um, before you're actually feeling sorry for her. I mean, that's my view anyway. No, exactly. And this, this other lady who uh, left Lee, she's 45 years old, uh, Wajda Rashid, um, did you meet her as well, am I right in thinking? Yeah, I've interviewed her. Right. I interviewed her. She was, she was introduced to me by Shamima. Right. Shamima found her an irritant, this woman. She said, look, can you speak to her? She irritates me. So Shamima's got no sympathy for anybody. So this woman come up with me. She's got shrapnel in her neck, travelling to her brain. Um, the likelihood she will die in that camp um, if she doesn't get help. Because in the summer, the metal inside her neck heats up and in the cold, it freezes and she fits. The sad news is she's got a boy called Adam, who's seven years of age, who will also be the first stateless orphan. And now I do feel slightly sorry for him, but he also chucks rocks at the Western journalists. So a lot of, a lot of work needs to be done on these kids. Mm. We've got to really be careful what we say, oh, we'll bring them back, bring them back. Think hard about that. OK. Andrew, and you've got, I understand, a Danger Zone out on Amazon Prime at the moment, your new film? Yeah, get and watch it, everybody. It's another controversial thing. Um, it's about um, people like myself. I started um, my journalist career. It's about going, to, they would say, for holidays to war zones. Um, but my, I was kind of a bit of an adventure tourist, so it follows my last seven years of journey. Get on Amazon Prime and watch it. It's fantastic. I'm, I'm in it. I'm sure. Of course, it's going to be marvellous. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Andrew, <laughs> thank, Andrew you, Dawn. There. thank you, Dawn. Thank so you much. very much. Uh, OK, I'm Dawn Neeson. This is GB News Sunday, and there's plenty more coming up on today's show, so don't go too far. But first, the news with Erin Armstrong. Very good afternoon to you. It is 2.34. I'm Aaron Armstrong. New video released by Islamic State appears to corroborate its claim of responsibility for Friday's attack in Moscow. Russians are observing a national day of mourning after more than 130 people died. The new video released by IS shows gunmen filming themselves moving through the concert hall and searching for victims. 
and we've chosen not to show that. It appears to contradict accusations by President Putin that Ukraine was involved, accusations Kyiv has denied. The White House says Islamic State's claim is credible and that the Kremlin dismissed warnings from the US that an extremist attack may be imminent, the Kremlin dismissing those as propaganda. The sign there of sirens in Ukraine, which was hit by a series of Russian attacks overnight. Residents of Kyiv were forced to shelter in subway stations, while elsewhere in the country, critical infrastructure in the western region near Lviv was also targeted. One missile breached the border with Poland, which is a NATO member. At least 10,000 civilians have been killed in Ukraine since Russia's invasion. The Prince and Princess of Wales uh, have said they're enormously touched by the messages of support from the public following cancer, Catherine's cancer diagnosis. She revealed on Friday she has started treatment. A statement from Kensington Palace uh, says the couple are grateful uh, that the public understand their request for privacy. The Chancellor has doubled down on his claim £100,000 a year is not a huge salary. Jeremy Hunt says it doesn't go as far as you'd think for people in his Surrey constituency because of rising house prices and the cost of living. He also said he expects the general election to take place in October. Well, you can sign up to GB News Alerts for the latest by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thank you very much, Erin. Uh, remember, you can get in touch about all the stories we're talking about today by emailing me on gbviews at gbnews. They're on your screen. Or message me on our socials. We're at gbnews. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Now, don't you dare go too far. Cracking bit coming up. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Today looks much better, with plenty of sunshine across much of the UK, certainly a much brighter day than on Saturday. That's all thanks to a little ridge of high pressure moving in from the west, with low pressure now moving off uh, to the east of the UK. But notice further weather systems gathering out towards west, and that will turn things more unsettled once again during the week ahead. Back to the detail now for the rest of the day. So plenty of sunshine around, just one or two showers feeding down from the north or northwest, particularly across northern parts of Scotland. Still a bit wintry here across the hilltops. But with lighter winds generally, more in the way of sunshine around, it should feel warmer out and about with temperatures up to 12 or 13 Celsius. 13 in London is 55 in Fahrenheit. As we go through the evening and during the overnight period, towards the north and east we'll see a lot of clear weather, the showers fading, turning quite chilly here with those clear spells. With that towards the west, it's starting to turn pretty wet, particularly across Northern Ireland, parts of Wales and the southwest of England. Some heavy bursts of rain in places here by Monday morning. Temperatures down to two or three Celsius towards the north and east, so I say there will be a touch of frost by Monday morning. Was that towards the west, those temperatures start to rise, but that heralds a pretty wet day out across the west, and particularly down towards the southwest of England. Could be some quite heavy rain at times here. And notice as that rain moves into colder air across Scotland, it will start to turn to snow, particularly on modest hills above about two or three hundred metres. Could be a fair bit of snow here tomorrow night, with some heavy rain towards the east and southeast of the country too. Brighter skies down towards the southeast with 12 degrees. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria De Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels 
we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Welcome back to GB News Sunday with me, Dawn Needham, on your telly, online and on digital radio. Now, sharing bad news with young children can be a very delicate task. Addressing what to say, how much to say and how to break it to them gently can be absolutely mind-boggling. Our next guest today is the author of the book, The Monster in Mummy. I love that title. The book is about demonstifying, if you like, cancer for youngsters. Um, this lady's book has helped thousands to make the journey with her children easier. Now, Donya Youssef, the author of this book, and with the wonderful sentiment behind it, I love the title, has joined us. Donya, just tell me a little bit briefly about your personal history with cancer. Um, I was diagnosed in 2017, um, and it had spread from the breast to the lymph nodes. Um, so they had to start the chemo straight away. Um, I was BRCA2, I found out halfway through chemo. I had an 18-month-old baby and a three-year-old little girl, and I was running a company, and oh it was, yeah, it was full on. Yeah. Um, I did the chemo, and, um, yeah, there was obviously complications throughout. I was pretty much in hospital every single round of chemo. Um, I had to take the little ones out of nursery in the end because... I was just picking up everything. Um, I got through it, <laughs> which was great news. Um, it did come back in the bowel um, a couple of years after. Um, and it came back. I got skin cancer just December, just gone, starting chemo again tomorrow. <laughs> oh, <don't you? laughs> yeah, so... But being a BRCA carrier, there's a lot of cancer, unfortunately, yes, in my family. Yes, yeah. um, but I think... Where I've obviously come from. Can we just explain what a bracket carrier is? It's a, a, a gene, isn't it, that yes. means you're more disposed to, yeah. to develop a cancer, so yeah. breast cancer in particular. Yeah, and ovarian cancer. Yeah. So they had to give me a hysterectomy um, when I was 39. Um, so I went through the menopause and obviously can't have any more children, but I'm grateful I've got two beautiful mm. girls. Mm. Um, so it's was a journey. I'd probably say to anybody else, just it's like a marathon and life changes. Um, and it's just all about keeping, you know, a positive mindset, finding an outlet. My outlet was literally writing and I literally just wrote this book in the chemo ward. And it was oh. it was literally I was struggling. Hold it up. To the <laughs> oh, you, you can see it on screen yeah. there. This is Donya's book, The Monster in <laughs> Mummy. Demonstify cancer for children. Um, so, but you, you actually wrote this while you were being while treated. I was in the chemo ward and running a company. Um, I mean, initially when I first got diagnosed, it was all very formal, and the consultant shook my hand and said, "I'm, I'm sorry to say you have got cancer." So I was like, "Oh my goodness!" Um, I'm, all I kept thinking of is my children. Of you know, a little baby had to abruptly stop breastfeeding, mm -hmm. um, which was a good thing. Um, but it was. Yeah, it was a journey, because I didn't feel poorly. And that was the scariest thing. Yeah. But I noticed my children, you know, because they didn't understand at that age. Um, the little one did develop um, separation anxiety, um, which I got a play therapist for. She's absolutely fine now. But it was just... Mummy was in hospital a lot. Um, so, so how do you... I mean, it, this is, you know, for an adult, mm. this, these are the words no-one wants to hear yeah. ever, mm. really. And, the, and, no. and obviously we're talking about this because it, it, what Catherine is going through now with three young children herself. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, as I said, I keep saying I love the title. Mm. How do you explain it? Catherine will have done this with her three, mm. who are all under the age of ten. How do you explain it to youngsters? How far do you go? How 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 much do you how much information do you give them? Well, that was it. It was I was really struggling because the little one obviously couldn't speak, but was the behaviour was getting worse. Yeah. So I was struggling with the behaviour, and the eldest one did know what was going on. Um, how old were that time? She was three, going on four. Right. Yeah. Um, and the little one was just turning two, so. 
I reached out to try and find some literature at the time, but I couldn't find that much. Um, so I didn't even intend to write a book. I just wanted to get like a little diary. But then when I went on all these other Facebook groups, there was a lot of a lot younger mothers than me yes. um, were really struggling. So I thought, OK, I've got to bring something to the table to help others because I hate seeing anyone else suffer. And I thought, OK, I'll write this down. And then when I got put into remission, I was like, I've got to, I've got to help because I've got all the information from the little ones on how I could bring something yeah. positive to the table. So it's finding an outlet. And actually, I was very honest with my children because adults, the word cancer, it's like... <gasps> it's, you know. it's one of the scariest words you can hear. Children haven't got a clue. They no. don't know what it is. So, I mean, it was like, Mummy's got to go into hospital, have some very strong medicine, um, which might, you know, my hair will go. Because um, that's scary for little ones as well, isn't it? When mummy suddenly looks different and maybe, yeah. you know, puffy with steroids and things. That, I mean, I put on three stones, so I was thinking I was going to lose weight. I mean, I, I ballooned. Um, my little one actually loved my bald head and she used to oh, stroke yes. it like a soother. <laughs> um, so that was a positive. The eldest one was a little bit scared. But there's wigs and there's scarves and actually it doesn't need to be all doom and gloom. So when I got diagnosed back again the second time, it was fine. And my children are absolutely fine because I was very, very honest with them. I found literally do not hide anything from them because they're, they're little people. And that, well, I find yeah. unfortunately we're running out of time, okay. don't you? Would that be your advice to Catherine and William, to be as honest as they can with the children? 100%. And we're all behind you. It, it's not as scary initially as a first diagnosis. That is the worst part, the yeah. first initial diagnosis. Yeah. After that... Kids are so adaptable and, yeah, we're sending all our love out to Kate and the family. Of course we are. Uh, Donya Youssef, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And Donya's book is The Monster in Mummy, which is available on sale now. Yeah, it's available yeah. on Amazon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much and, and huge you. amounts of good luck with your treatment tomorrow. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Donya. Uh, now, OK, we move on. I'm Dawn Neeson. This is GB News Sunday. And very shortly, we'll be discussing whether we should feel proud to be English in the wake of the Nike shirt scandal. My panel will debate this, as well as the clock issue. GB News, Britain's news channel. Don't go too far. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Is the brand of toothpaste super important here or is it more about the toothbrush? Because I was told a long time ago by my dentist, electric toothbrush, Pip, that is the way to go. You're exactly right. I mean, the action of mechanically removing plaque, so using a brush, is much more effective than the brand of toothpaste itself. But in terms of the ingredient in toothpaste that we're looking for, it's something called fluoride. And fluoride is essential to help remineralize and strengthen our teeth. It's really important to use a toothpaste with fluoride. And in terms of brushing, using an electric toothbrush is just much easier. You know, you're brushing your teeth first thing in the morning, last thing at night, you're gonna be a bit tired in those times. So using an electric toothbrush, you just hold it against your tooth and gum and it does all the work for you. So it's just much easier in my opinion. But you have to use your electric toothbrush properly. You're exactly right, yeah. There is a technique of actually brushing your teeth, although it sounds really simple. With an electric toothbrush, you have to hold it against the tooth and the gum. Ideally, you want a pressure sensor in that toothbrush so you know exactly when you're pressing too hard. But if you're using a manual toothbrush, you need to move it around and small circular motions. But actually, what I see is people who use manual toothbrushes, they tend to over-scrub and over-brush, which can actually lead to gum recession and your enamel thinning long term. Sometimes I will get up in the morning and I will have breakfast and then I'll brush my teeth. Is that wrong? <laughs> Unfortunately, that's wrong. So the best time to brush your teeth is first thing in the morning as soon as you wake up. If you're brushing after you eat and after breakfast, you're brushing your teeth in that weakened, acidic state. So your teeth are actually under attack and they're much more vulnerable.
Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, welcome back to GB News Sunday with me, Dawn Neeson, on your TV, online and on digital radio. Now, it's coming up again next weekend. Why do the clocks change in this country? In the UK, we set the clocks ahead an hour in spring and back, you know, fall back in autumn, spring, forward. OK, that's how you remember. But that happens next Sunday, right? OK, so we all get less time in bed. It gets Darker in the morning, but late at 10 o'clock, light at 10 o'clock at night. Uh, we're not the only ones to do this, by the way. UK is one of several countries in the Northern Hemisphere to change the clocks um, according to the seasons. But do we really need to do it? I mean, come on, who needs it to be light at 10 o'clock at night, Albie? I need it to be light oh, in God. the evening, Dawn, because those of us who, who, who work... Who have a life. ..work long hours are quite used to getting up when it's dark and then going to work, but it's always nice in the evenings to have some extra time of daylight to do things, whether or not it's go to the gym, whether or not it's to walk in the park, just be outside. And I never understand why in the autumn we have to go away from British summertime and go back to ah, go back so, to GMT. Okay, so, you just... so I'd like us to stay in British summertime, British summertime for the whole year. OK. But I believe Scotland is what prevents us from doing that. I'm oh, sure, well, Claire, sure Claire will tell us all about it. So we're bringing the Scottish person. Well, it's not actually. It was the Scottish farmers. That's the reason why they did it, for high up in the nor northern, northern hemisphere, the northern parts of Scotland for the crofters. And that's why, so they could actually see their flocks of sheep um, and whatever Just other flocks that the they had. Cars. Dawn, that's very anti... <laughs> Just a thought. Well, no, it's not very environmentally friendly, is it? Are we going to go down that route? Um, so that's the reason. That's the reason. But look, all of our viewers, children, who are doing Easter egg hunts next week because it happens on Easter Sunday, make sure they're wrapped up and try to get them down to sleep before the Easter bunnies arrive so they can go out in the light with their hour less in bed and hunt for chocolate, because that's what the, the parents need. Now. And actually, it wasn't the Scottish farmers that we should blame for this, either. <clears throat> it was uh, the German emperor, basically, right. Kaiser Wilhelm II, on the 30th of April 1916. He proclaimed that his dominions would henceforth pretend that it was one hour later than it actually was, because it was something to do with, actually, the environment. Yeah. Actually, you know, sort of like coal and staving... Yeah, it, it was going to win the war for them. And it didn't. And look how that turned. <laughs> you know the only other country that's in line with British summertime is Portugal. Oh. But if you go travel to Portugal, you don't need to move so you the earth. That horrible thing, right? And just quickly, while we, we were talking about England earlier on, while we've got a Scottish person, uh, very very quickly, mm -hmm. would you, you you would not the messing around with the England flag on that England shirt? No, no other country would do it. it. No, the Scots won't put up with it. But I see myself as British more than Scottish, and I don't have any cuckold at all to uh, Scottish politics, as uh, as you well know. I've got four English children born in England, um, but I think it's absolutely. Disaster. And I think the, the sign-off from the FA, whoever did that sign-off, really ought to be held account because it's an appalling way to treat an identity, to treat something that symbolises a country's <laughs> identity. And why do it? What is this supposed to symbolise? Uh, I'll be quick response from you. I know Goodness you me. You well, look, I mean, look, there have been versions of the Union Jack that UKIP did for their, for their logo. There have been versions that the Conservative Party have done. There is a Team GB kit in 2022. 2012, 2012, 
no one particularly cared about it, and I can't uh, particularly care about this. How very dare he? Well, I'm afraid I'm going to leave on that note. I'm just going to punch him if that's okay. <laughs> um, I'm not actually. Uh, but that's <laughs> almost it from me. But Nana is up next. Uh, who's got a cracking show lined up? Nana, what's coming up on your show? Well, um, we're talking about some of these groveling celebrities who are now issuing apologies after coming up with conspiracy theories about Princess Catherine. Uh, plus, imagine being trafficked and being trafficked to another country. Coming up in five, my big guest was trafficked, and she's going to tell us all about her story. And then my producer, he was fined £150 for what? Picking his nose, smoking a cigarette, dropping a cigarette, or perhaps spitting in the street. What do you think? Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. We've seen a much quieter day across the UK today, more in the way of sunshine than on Saturday, but things will turn more unsettled again during the week ahead. It's this little ridge of high pressure that's been moving in from the west, quieting the weather down, but notice low pressure gathering again out towards the west, and I say this will be turning things more unsettled through uh, tonight into Monday. As we go through the evening and overnight period then, the showers towards the north and east of the UK will tend to ease. We'll see lots of clear weather around, and here it will turn quite chilly with a touch of frost by Monday morning. Whereas out towards the west and southwest, that rain is gathering. Some of the rain starting to turn quite heavy by the morning on Monday.